If you have a Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, all the verses I'm going to be reading will be on the screen today, too. If you don't have access to a Bible, you can follow along on the screens. And, um, and we're going to be talking about uh, a topic of sin today, which is not your typical Easter sermon, um, but I, but I want to draw our attention to it for a couple reasons. The first reason is that at our church, we love to do what's called expository preaching. We just go verse by verse through books of the Bible. What that does is it keeps me from just preaching my opinions. Um, it keeps us as a church from just picking hobby horses and soapboxes to preach from. And so um, at our church, we're going through the book of Genesis. We're going to be doing that for the rest of the year. And, um, and so we have started Genesis just a couple weeks ago. We're in chapter 3 today. And, and what we're going to look at in chapter 3 is the very first sin. And that might seem a, a little bit of an interesting or, or unusual Easter passage, um, but I think it's, it's fitting that we talk about it because it has, it has great bearing on the reason for Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Um, and, and, and in talking about sin on Easter, we're talking about something that a lot of people don't want to talk about, right? Um, there are some things that everybody does that we just don't talk about, like everybody poops, right? Um, we, but but it's, it's weird if you make that the topic of conversation a lot. I know from experience, people are weirded out by that. My dog ate glitter one time and, and pooped glitter. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's my favorite small talk conversation. If you ever want to talk about that, it's just an experience I would love to share. Um, but, but again, it's something that's, that's common to all humanity, but we never talk about it. Um, and, and sin is the same way. All of us sin. All of us have wretched things that we've got in the closet that we don't want to share, we don't want to talk about, yet all of us sin. It is a, it is a uh, global and universal uh, human experience to, to sin. And so I want to talk about what sin is, um, why it's important that we understand what sin is, and what God thinks of our sin. And, and I know some of you are like, yeah, but it's Easter and Jesus is alive. Can't we just talk about the resurrection? Well, listen, Jesus would have never been dead in the first place if it weren't for your sin. And so it's important this, uh, this day that we start at the very beginning in Genesis 3 as we see what sin is and how it actually leads us to the cross and the resurrection. Um, the first thing, I'll, I'm going to take you through four points that I want you to understand this Easter. Number one, that all people sin. Uh, that all of us fall short of the glory of God. Secondly, that all people are in denial, at least before uh, encountering Christ. All people are in denial about their sin. Thirdly, that God rightly and justly punishes sin and his holiness. And fourthly, that God gives grace. These are great truths that we're going to meditate on. If you would, bow your heads with me and let me pray over uh, this sermon. Lord, thank you so much for being a great and gracious God. And Lord, as we turn our attention to sin, um, Lord, may we also turn our attention to your great grace to forgive such great sin. Um, God, would you help me as a, as a broken and sinful man um, to preach the truth of the gospel, to, to preach the whole counsel of your word. And Lord, may you, um, may you do exactly what you want this Easter. May you um, resurrect people's souls, accomplish in them what you will um, in this church and in churches all over the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Point one, all people sin. It's important for you to understand this. It's imperative for your entire life, I believe, that you understand your depravity. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, the common word for sin that's, that's used in the Bible has the imagery built into the Greek language of, of missing the mark. It's an archery term. Um, I, was, I was hanging out with my, with my boys the other day, um, my boys and, and uh, Pastor Jeremy's son. We were sitting in the hot tub watching them shoot things, which is probably the most redneck and dangerous activity you could do. Just me and Jeremy in the hot tub, our boys shooting stuff in the yard, right? And, and Tava gets his, his bow and arrow, and he's like one yard from this bottle of root beer that he wants to put an arrow through. And he just keeps missing it over and over and over again. I'm like, dude, you can't get any closer than that. And, um, and, and what we see in, in what sin is, in, in the definition of it, it means to miss the mark. It means that God has given us and revealed to us what a bullseye is. Uh, what a direct target and hit is, and we miss it time and time again. And to miss that mark is sin, and we can sin in different ways. We can sin actively or passively. Sin is doing the wrong thing, doing something that God has told you not to do, but sin can also be passive, not doing the good things that God has commanded you to do, things like going to church. Um, and, and so the Bible also tells us we have a sin nature. Ephesians 2, 3 mentions that we were by nature children of wrath. 
And so if you are a parent, you can give a hearty amen to the fact that your kids are little pagans. Amen? They're, they're hellions. They're vipers in diapers, as we say. And, and so they're just, they have, you can see it very clearly, they have a natural proclivity to just be ornery. Um, and, and what this what this theological point shows us in the scriptures is that it means we have a natural proclivity towards sin and also that we're born into sin. Romans 5.12 um, roots this into uh, the sin that happened, the first sin that happened in Genesis 3. Romans 5 says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so you don't have to like this, nor should you, but you can't ignore this. You cannot ignore the problem of your sin. Ignoring sin will surely lead to your death, your eternal death, because God will punish your sin. Now, what I want to present to you today is how do we, uh, how do we remedy this disease that has been handed down to us um, from our parents, Adam and Eve. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now the serpent, this is Satan, we'll find out. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The first seed of temptation from Satan to humanity is to sow doubt in the minds of mankind. Um, to say, did God actually say this? And, and some of us may be tempted to think these same types of thoughts. Is, is everything that God's told us about sin really true? Would a loving God actually send people to a literal hell? But, but let me tell you that it is important for us to take God at his word rather than using our, our feelings to, to make decisions uh, on what we believe or using um, our reason or our logic uh, solely. God has told us what he has uh, chosen for us to know. And here Satan sows seeds of doubt to Eve, and she responds by quoting God's command in verse 3. Uh, she says, But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. I want you to notice what Eve does as she quotes God's word back to Satan. Uh, she had heard from her husband Adam what God originally said. And she adds to God's word. God never said, don't touch it. He said, don't eat of that tree. And so what, what Eve has done is she's placed a greater weight upon her own shoulders that she's able to bear. And this is what legalism always does. When we add to God's word and when we, when we take religion and we make it a list of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts that we have to follow, rather than receiving Jesus' true grace that he gives through his death and resurrection, then we add to ourselves a weight that we can't stand up to. We can't live up to uh, what, what the standard is. And, and what Eve does is she adds to God's word, um, making a rule that wasn't there, and then she puts misconceptions on what God actually says. We do the same thing, and we put misconceptions on top of the gospel that aren't there, and this is Satan's ploy to us. Let me make it very clear. You don't need to jump through any religious hoops to clean yourself up. Matter of fact, I would say don't try to clean yourself up, but rather cling yourself up to Christ. Cling to him, not your works or your ability or your own righteousness. You should cast off your righteousness because the Bible says your best day is like a filthy rag in the sight of God. It is altogether unfit for his presence, but Jesus' perfect work, that's the righteousness that we need to attain. Satan continues to tempt the woman in verse 4, and says, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And so he moves from sowing doubt to being an outright liar. The Bible calls Satan the father of lies, and here he moves from doubting to lying. And when they ate from the tree, um, they would prove Satan wrong. They would die. They would become spiritually dead instantly, and their perfectly crafted bodies that God made with love would begin to age and decay. The aches and pains that you guys feel as you get older are a result of the curse of sin. The pounds that, that we struggle to keep off are a result of sin. The gray in my beard that my wife mistook recently for toothpaste in my beard is just, is just a sign of aging, right? It's just the curse. It happens. And we, we grow old because of the curse of sin. And look at what happens in verse 6. The woman begins to reason. And she begins to think about what the serpent is saying to her. 
And she acts like Rory from Gilmore Girls. If you've ever seen the show, the character Rory always makes a pro-con list for everything that she does. And here, Eve makes a pro-con list, and, and on, the, on the tree's pro-con list, there's a lot of good stuff in the pro side. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And so the tree scored pretty good. It had good food. It was beautiful to look at. It was artistic and creative, and it was desired to make one wise. And so she eats of the tree, and she gives it to her husband. Now note, before you chauvinists blame all your problems on a woman here, Adam's, Adam's with her in her presence as this happens. What a terrible husband, right? If a snake rolls up and starts a conversation with my wife, I'm ending it right there, right? Like, snake, you ain't talking to my wife. I barely let other dudes talk to her, let alone a snake, okay? And, and he lets this go on, and he, he willingly participates, and actually he's held responsible for the fall of man in Scripture, not Eve. But as they look upon the tree and they see all the benefits, at least what they perceive to be benefits of the tree, they act selfishly and they sin. You see, sin will always look like some benefit to you or else you wouldn't sin. There will always be something enticing and good about your sin or else you wouldn't live in it. Sin will always look like some benefit to us, but it will only bring death to us. The Bible makes that clear. Secondly, we see that all people are in denial about this problem that they have called sin. Most of us tend to think more highly of ourselves than is reality, especially in regard to spiritual standards that we, we should have or that God has given us. And Adam and Eve had a spiritual standard that God gave them. He very clearly told them what was good and what was evil. They didn't have to eat the tree to know what evil was. They knew it was good to eat from all the trees in the garden that God had given them, and they knew it was evil to eat from the one tree that he had forbidden them to eat from. But now, when they eat of this, they have experiential knowledge. It says that their eyes are opened. And the first thing they notice is interesting. They notice their nakedness. Um, it's like when you turn the, the shower on, and you're naked, and you're waiting for the hot water to come on, and you just feel a little bit weird out there. Listen, I can't prove it theologically, but I'm convinced the feeling that Adam and Eve felt in that moment was the same feeling that you feel when you're naked, but you got tennis shoes on. It's, it's that, that feeling, I think, is what they felt, Okay. Um, I can't prove that, but I think that's how they felt. Verse 7 says, The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they just feel this embarrassment quickly and suddenly. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, some artists render this as beautiful, ancient uh, clothing in the garden. Um, but in reality, this is a sad attempt to cover their shame and guilt. When Adam and Eve sin, the very first thing they do, literally, is cover their butts. They, they seek to cover their own butts physically, but even in denying their sin, they're going to they're gonna try to place the blame on someone other than themselves. And it's, it's embarrassing, and it's shameful. And we look at them and how they react to their sin, and I want you to look at your own sin and just think on that for a moment and know that you do the exact same miserable thing with your sin. Every time that you fail to live up to God's standard, you do everything you can to rationalize it or justify why you didn't do what God has expected you to do. Every New Year's resolution that's godly that you give up on, every Easter that you say you're going to get it back together, every promise to God to get back in church as a response to your failure and sin, every good work that you think will mask a closet full of sin that you hide from everyone else, it is all a pitiful attempt to cover up shame. And it should be embarrassing to you. And I want you to see that in the garden, we plainly see that God sees the nakedness of our sin exposed to him, and we can't hide from it. Verse 8 tells us that God comes and physically walks in the garden, and then he calls out in verse 9 to Adam. Verse 9 says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Here you see Adam hiding from God. How silly this is. Doesn't he know that God knows all things and sees all things? What an utterly useless attempt to hide from God, yet we do it all the time. God asks Adam, where are you? Let me tell you, it wasn't because God couldn't find him. It wasn't because Adam was really good at hide and seek. 
You see, God didn't need the answer. Adam needed the question. Where are you? And this morning, I think some of you need the question as well. God doesn't need the answer of where you are spiritually. He knows exactly where you stand. He knows whether or not the blood of Jesus has been applied to your heart and you've been forgiven of sins or whether you're still living in the rebellion of your sin. He knows exactly where you are, but you need the question this morning. Where are you with Jesus? Hebrews 4.13 says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, Adam and Eve and their fall are examples to all of us that we're unable to hide our sin from a holy God. God continues in his line of questioning in verse 11. He says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, now here comes the blame game. The woman whom you gave to be with me. He's not even blaming the woman. He's blaming God. The woman that you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. They act just like my five kids act. When I come into disaster in my home and I didn't see what happens, I begin questioning everyone. They all point fingers at each other. They begin to play the blame game. And all of us do the same thing before God. We vehemently seek to deny our guilt, but deep down we know that we are guilty. We know that we all stand guilty of sin in front of a holy God. And if you're not able to see your sin, you will never see your Savior. If you're not able to understand the fact that you are a jacked up sinner in need of grace, then you can never appreciate the resurrection. You can come to Easter services all you want, but if you don't understand how far removed you are from a holy God by your sin, then the resurrection is utterly meaningless to you. It's so imperative that we understand That Jesus had to die because of our depravity, because of our sinfulness, because of the curse. Let's look at point three, that God punishes sin. He hands down this curse rightly and justly. Now, when I read these curses, it might it might sound to you like God is mean, but let me let me promise you that He is loving and He's upholding His holiness. I recently watched uh, a movie, Pirates of the Caribbean, something or other, the fifth one. I didn't know there was five of them. They're trying to rival fast and furious. And, um, and, and what's funny is I watched the fifth one with my son Judah and they're the same as the other four, right? It's like, there's a curse and there's pirates that are like half dead, but they're kind of stuck and they need someone to lift the curse. And there's always a guy that wants to lift the curse. And there's always some other guy that's like, you have to find Jack Sparrow. And then he shows up and he's always drunk. And then, and then for some reason he's got the keys, right? To lift the curse. It's the same story five times. Um, well, they ripped that off from the Bible. Okay. Um, here we have God handing down a curse, and the rest of the Bible is the story of God lifting the curse, undoing the curse that we brought upon ourselves. And he hands this curse down because he is loving, because he upholds holiness. God will never let sin go unpunished. He's too good for that. And so he begins by cursing the serpent first in verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God curses the serpent by sending it to its belly. Now, uh, we, we don't know exactly what's going on here. Um, Satan either possesses an animal in the garden, a serpent, or Satan takes the form of a serpent, but evidently it had feet or wings or something else, and God curses it by putting it in the ground so it'll slither. And, and either way, snakes, uh, whatever was the case, we don't know, but what is known is that snakes are a vivid reminder of death and sin. That's why I'm like Indiana Jones. I hate snakes. Uh, ben Hewitt brought a snake to VBS this past summer. And it was like touch a snake day. And, and that somebody put a picture on the internet of holding a snake of me. And, and I'm, it's a miracle that you are at Easter service at New Heights because we, we became known as a snake handling church. And, um, and I was like trying to, trying to do damage control on the internet. No, 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 I hate snakes, I promise. We're not going to get the snakes out. Their existence in the dust reminds us of death. And then verse 15, as God curses the serpent, he says that you're, 
He says, serpent, your, your head will be bruised, and you'll merely bruise the heel of the offspring of the woman. This is a foreshadowing of hope. It's a glimmer of salvation. Uh, scholars call this in Greek the proto-euangelion. It means first gospel. The first good news that's given after sin is that there would be an offspring of Eve who would come to do battle against the serpent and defeat him. The genealogy of Jesus is traced back to the first humans in Luke chapter 3. The offspring of Eve truly is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he does have his heel bruised. The spike was driven through his heel at the cross, but as Jesus dies on the cross, he crushes the head of the serpent once and for all. He's been defeated, church. And on their first day as sinner, God looks at Adam and Eve and he gives them hope in a coming Savior. Everyone in the Old Testament is saved the same way that we're saved, by hoping in Jesus, although they didn't have the experience of his life and, and see the, the beauty of the crucifixion and the resurrection, but they were saved by placing their faith in a coming Savior. And we're saved by placing our faith in a Savior who we have seen come to this world, live a perfect life, die on the cross, and raise from the dead. He continues, God continues by cursing the woman. He says to the woman in verse 16, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. You see, because of the curse, all life comes through intense pain. My firstborn daughter was born down in Taze Valley at the birthing center because my wife's a hippie. And there were, there were no drugs, there were no doctors present, like it was just scary stuff. And we were kind of out there on our own, but by God's grace, Bella was born. And, um, but, but in childbirth and labor and delivery, you see the intense pain of the curse on full display. Woman's curse is seen through nurturing and bringing forth life and how difficult it is because of the fall. But then Jesus not willing that he would leave us in this fallen, cursed state, comes even through that experience of labor and delivery, through the pain of that. He became human. He would grow in a womb and be born through the pain of labor and delivery that we celebrate Christmas after Christmas. A teenager's placenta would nourish God himself through an umbilical cord, and he would be born. God, the divine, would be born as a man. And as this child grew into a man, he would become the perfect bridegroom to submit to, as, as we, the bride of Christ, the church, submit to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, who will no longer lead us into sin like Adam did, but will lead us into righteousness. And then the third curse he gives is to Adam. Not just Adam, but also creation itself. To Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. See, when God speaks to Adam to curse him, he doesn't just merely curse him. He curses his home. He curses creation itself. He curses the dominion that had been given to Adam. Thorns and thistles didn't exist before sin. And so if you've ever been walking in the woods and got caught up in briars and thorns, or if you've ever been clean and brush and it just makes you mad as you, as you see how difficult it is, just know that's a result of sin. We even have a good reminder of it around the sanctuary today in the object lesson of a rose, that the beauty at the head of a rose only comes through the growth of the stem that's covered with thorns. Uh, in 1988, poison taught us that great theological truth, right? Every rose has its thorn. Okay. But roses didn't always have thorns, and they won't always have thorns. Those came as evidence of the fall, of the curse. And God continues, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, because of sin, work would become hard labor instead of joyful and easy worship. And given that our work is difficult and imperfect and we're incapable we should thank God today that our eternity does not depend on our ability. Amen? Our eternity does not depend on our ability. It depends on Jesus' ability, who is the greater worker, again, fulfilling the curse that Adam could never fulfill on his own. Jesus is the greater worker. 1 Corinthians 15 says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so we get this glimmer of grace, which is the fourth and final point, that God gives grace. In the midst of all this death and cursing, life graciously continued. 
As it turns out, God was not finished creating. He would continue on by making new creations, both physically in procreation and spiritually in salvation. Verse 20 says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. As man multiplied, sin multiplied as well. As more humans and souls are born into sin. But with every sinner that has been born gives it an opportunity for God to be all the more glorified through his grace. That every soul that he creates comes the potential for redemption from the fall. And it starts with the first couple. And he shows them grace in verse 21. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Now for them to have garments, clothing of skin, there had to be death. Matter of fact, the very first death had to happen. There was a sacrifice in the garden. The first physical death was a sacrifice carried out by God to cover his children. In the closing verses of this chapter, God sends them out from his perfect garden, expels them from it, but not without covering them with grace first. Generations later, the promised offspring of the woman would succeed where all ancestors had failed before. He would meet the serpent, not in a garden, but in the wilderness. And Satan would come and tempt Jesus, but he would stand strong, not yielding to the temptation to sin, but rather honor the Father's will. He would quote Scripture perfectly, not, not mangling it to the serpent, but, but quote God's word perfectly to the serpent. He would stand through the serpent's temptation to be a perfect lamb. Though man had been expelled from a garden, this lamb would then step into a garden known as the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Not my will, but yours be done, Father. He willingly subjected himself to death because of your sin. In the Old Testament, animal after animal after animal was slain and their blood was spilt to continually remind the people that blood needed to be spilled to pay for sins. The Bible says that, that for sins, penalty, that, that without the remission or without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so until the final lamb was slain, animal after animal is slain to foreshadow it, and then the only truly perfect one, Jesus Christ, subjects himself to sacrifice. John looked at him and and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 5 calls him Christ, our Passover Lamb, who has been sacrificed. You see, Jesus willingly became the ultimate man, doing what no other man or woman could do. He's the last man, he's the last Adam, and he subjected himself to cruel mockery and murder. In John 19 it says, Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. You see, the very thorns that didn't exist before sin, the very thorns that grew from the earth as a result of the curse were used to torture our Savior as they squashed them into his brow. You see what Jesus did? He took the curse and he wore it as a crown. He's a king. He's victorious. And he subjected himself and laid his life down. It wasn't taken from him. He laid his life down so that he could pay for all of your sins. And he surrendered to death to be your sacrifice. And he rose from death to be your savior. And if you don't understand that, that, that your sin is why Jesus died, then don't bother celebrating the resurrection today. But if you see this to be true, and I hope you do, then the resurrection then carries so much more weight because it's in light of his death that Jesus took my curse to the grave to leave it there, to bury it, to take care of it once and for all. And he rose victorious and proclaimed to Christians like me, your sin is paid for, it's taken care of, it's done. I'm not bringing it up anymore. And so week after week, I can gather with other people who are just as much messed up as me, and we can sing songs to Jesus, and we can listen to his word, and we can worship him because he's taken the curse away from us through his resurrection. And millions, probably billions of people gather today to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is still alive. 
Let me just call you to this. As you acknowledge that just by your presence here today, don't let it be in vain because you really just live in your sin still. Put your sinful acts to death. Make a commitment today to honor Jesus, to live for him because he has died for you.